Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today. My name is Alex Templador, and this is the Racism and Tourism panel. I am a freelance travel writer who has written for everybody from Condé Nast Traveler to Travel and Leisure to Travel Pulse, writing in both lifestyle, you know, consumer publications and trade publications. And I'm really excited today to have this discussion about racism and tourism with a wonderful panel from around the world. We have everybody in different time zones. So this is really exciting that we could all come together right now to have this conversation. Um, this conversation really came about by the killing of George Floyd in Minnesota earlier this year. Um, it created resurgence in the Black Lives Matter movement. It a protest erupted around the world asking for demand and justice. And it also started a conversation in the travel and tourism industry. When all of this started happening, I wrote an article on how the travel industry can do its part to fight racism. I got connected with the Responsible Tourism Partnership with WTM. We started a YouTube series with Harold Goodwin on their YouTube channel, which I would suggest you go and watch some of those series and interviews with some of our panelists actually, um, who discuss what we can do to fight racism in the tourism industry. And then the second part of that is we wanted to have this panel today to continue the discussion, to offer concrete examples and ways in which we can fight racism and tourism. Um, we're going to cover a lot of topics today. We're gonna to discuss racism, allyship, representation, um, unconscious bias, everything that kind of goes underneath that umbrella. And so I'm excited for you to be here today to listen. Um, I am going to kind of go through a different, um, like a little outline of how we're gonna have this conversation. Um, we're gonna start with the racism and tourism conversation, travel markets, marketing and advertising, representation in tourism and the pandemic and how it relates to racism and tourism. To begin, I'm just going to ask each person a question and I will do a little introduction with that, so let's get started. Um, the first person I'd like to speak to today is Jock Ray Hill, a Southwest Airlines flight attendant who is based in Dallas, Texas. Jock Ray, you had an opportunity to speak with the American Airlines CEO, Doug, Doug Parker, about racism quite openly in May. Um, this is not a common thing for flight attendants to speak with CEOs, much less one that's not for the company that you work with. Um, why was it so significant for you to have this conversation with him and for CEOs in the travel industry to have this conversation with their employees? Uh, it was important to have a conversation with anybody. And because I didn't know who he was and we were able to have a genuine conversation before I even realized who he was, I think that even makes the whole experience a lot more um, profound. Um, I think that the reason that conversation, once I realized who he was, I realized how big that moment was, was because you know, we have times where we're making assumptions about other people. I, as an employee, make an assumption about a CEO. And that goes with race, that goes with, you know, different sexes, different religions. And I made an assumption about what that position held, especially like because of, you know, it's a business. So at the end of the day, they have to make decisions on their business. And so once I realized like how big that moment was and what I was able to have a conversation about, then I realized we all do it. Like I made an assumption about who he was as a CEO and that was not right. And because I was able to have a genuine conversation and actually express, I literally cried on his shoulder, <laughs> but have a genuine conversation about how I was feeling, it was mostly about my feelings, then he was able to speak to me. And then I just realized how much conversation matters because nothing gets solved if we do not have these types of conversations. Thank you so much. I, I'm so excited mm -hmm. that you got to have that conversation and I believe you've had another mm -hmm. one since that first one. So I hope you continue oh, yeah. to have these conversations. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so um, let me continue with Martinique Lewis. She is an award-winning diversity and travel consultant, creator of the ABC Travel Green Book, which you should go and buy, um, and president of the Black Travel Alliance. Um, Martinique, when the conversation around racism and tourism began earlier this year with 
public announcements by travel companies and brands supporting diversity or Black Lives Matter, whether they were putting up the black square on social media, um, you and the Black Travel Alliance stepped up and said, we need to hold these brands accountable. Um, why is it not enough for these companies just to put out BLM messages of support? And how can initiatives like the Black Travel Scorecard create lasting change? Um, yeah, well, basically we were like, how dare you? Um, one thing people, anybody who's seen me ever before is I'm very direct. I'm not afraid to speak what I'm feeling at the time. And if you do something, I am going to hold you accountable. All of the people who founded the Black Travel Alliance, there are 17 of us. We are all content creators. We're all influencers, digital marketers, um, journalists in the travel space. And we've been in this industry for over 10 years now, really where you can see visible Black people. So for a brand to all of a sudden post a square on June 2nd saying Black Lives Matter, but they don't hire us, you know, they don't pay us the same as they would pay our white colleagues colleagues, they don't answer our emails or our phone calls. It was like, how dare you? When has Black Lives Mattered other than when everybody was sitting in their house due to a global pandemic and forced to actually to actually say, okay, we really do have an actual race issue because we all had to see it. You know, never before were we all at home and had to really understand what injustice within the travel industry and within the world had to look like until a man died. Unfortunately, you know, that sent the world into a into an equality movement that we've never seen before. So it was like, we're calling your bluff for one, because you've never shown it before. We could see your social media that it was white, 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 and then 10 posts about black people. Well, where were those black people before? Where were the Asian people before? Where were the people in the wheelchairs before? And and it never was there until June. So it's like, why is diversity and inclusion only important to you now? I spoke at WTM last year about diversity and inclusion. I spoke at WTM the year before that about diversity and inclusion and nobody ever showed up other than my colleagues to these actual talks. So why now is it so important? So the Black Travel Alliance said, okay, we're not going to talk about it anymore. We're going to do something about it. And we knew that we had enough power within ourselves because of our connections in the travel industry to really hold the travel industry accountable. We did that through the pull up for cap travel campaign. Now, some people felt like, you know, we came off too strong. We we're like, if we didn't come off that strong, would you have gotten the message that we want to see change in the industry? Would you have gotten the message that you should spend money with Black content creators? Would you have gotten the message that you need to hire Black people internally? Would you have gotten that message? And the answer is no. You know, it's not until you force somebody to do so can really change happen, unfortunately, in the travel industry. But we do look forward to better days. You know, these conversations, like we said, they're super uncomfortable. Nobody really wants to sit there and look at the problem. But now we're forced to. And not only are we looking at the problem, we're looking at the solution. And we're starting to change our budgets to look at the solution. We're starting to change our budgets to hire in somebody specifically for diversity, equity, inclusion on our teams. We're starting to change our budgets to come in and bring people like me to do lunch and learn so you can understand unconscious bias, anti-racism, and how to be an ally. So I am hopeful that things look better. And even if things don't get better, the Black Travel Alliance is there to point out that you should be doing more, so. Thank you. So with the Black Travel Scorecard, um, these companies can send you information about what they've done in terms of equity and inclusion, correct? Yeah, yeah um, we, were, we were asking them specifically how many Black people do they have on their team, how much money they spend on marketing to the Black community, and those are the type of things they send in. Now, if they didn't have those figures, we asked them to tell us what those figures would be. So, for instance, a company I work for is called Skyrim. It's a mobile hotspot company. They have two Black people internally on their team, but I said, okay, so what are you going to do now to hire more Black people in tech? They said, okay, we'll make sure that we get a vendor booth at Afrotech that happens in San Francisco every year. We're going to spend $10,000 on Black influencers every year so that you can start seeing different types of people on our on our feed using our product. So those are different ways, you know, that, that companies can move forward thinking about ways to actually change what their marketing scheme looks like or even their internal teams. I love that. And if you're listening today, please reach out to the Black Travel Alliance and see how you can get involved with your company. Let's move on to um, specific travel markets. I want to talk to Keith Henry, who is the CEO of the Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada and KCD Consulting Incorporated, as well as the president and CEO of the, of the B BC Mati Federation and the director of tourism HR Canada. Um, Keith, I'm so curious, in your experience working in Indigenous tourism, 
what are some of the pitfalls that travel companies and brands fall into when it comes to working with indigenous communities on tourism and initiatives? Do they know how to be good allies or are they falling into unconscious bias when it comes to you know, campaigns, a partnership? Um, what can kind of be done better and how does ITAC help them? Great. So, well, good morning. Uh, I'm <laughs> pretty early here in Canada, so uh, thanks for having me on the panel. But I really, um, uh, you know, it's an honor, first of all, to be with everyone on the panel. But I think, um, you know, I've been in, in you know, I'm Indigenous myself. I've been working in Indigenous tourism uh, about the last uh, 15 years. Um, and I've seen the industry certainly start to move in the right direction. But there's a lot of unconscious bias. And, and, and the reason really is because well, I would just say it this way. We live by a saying for us and our, we, we're very diverse indigenous businesses in this country, hotels, restaurants, outdoor adventure, uh, you know, you name it. So we work with a lot of marketing partners, a lot of travel uh, agencies, a lot of tour operators. And we just try and tell them all, it's not about us without us. And the fact is, if you're not going to include us in really the way you create your marketing campaigns, the way you're investing in your marketing campaigns, you know, don't, you're not really a meaningful partner to us. You know, we've turned away some, some pretty significant brands uh, because the first thing they do is they phone us up and they say, or they send us an email and say, uh, we've, we're going to create this indigenous policy. Do you think you can give me an email that says it's we're on the right track? And uh, you know, our, my response has typically been, I don't work for you. Um, if you want to have a meaningful conversation, let's have a coffee or let's, well, maybe not in this COVID-19 time, but let's have a conversation. You know, and, uh, you know, I, it's difficult because we have a very diverse network now in Canada. We've set up to help Indigenous tourism grow. And, you know, Indigenous tourism is not new to our country. We love to promote Indigenous images. We love to promote this this perception that, that you know, that we're really supporting uh, Indigenous businesses. But the fact is we have a long ways to go. And if we're truly honest about it, where that unconscious bias really plays out, it does in a number of ways. From a marketing perspective, our country spends hundreds of millions of dollars marketing in, as prior to COVID. And of course, we will return to those days. Uh, you know, how much of that is really spent on promoting Indigenous tourism, although we love to show Indigenous images. How much of that is connected to an actual Indigenous business? And so what we're trying to say is it. You know, we love the fact that you want to uh, use our content, our images, our languages, the diversity of our, our, our Indigenous people in this country. We think it's a really important asset for the world to see. But let's make sure that it's inclusive. Let's make sure that it's truly an authentic message. And, you know, so there's, the you know, I've given you a few examples. The other thing we see a lot of is a lot of non-Indigenous businesses trying to just hire a couple people to make it look like it's an Indigenous experience. And that's where I get into the authenticity. It's really important for us in our country. Um, so, I mean, has it come a, a certain ways? Absolutely. We have a long ways to go, though. And I still feel that uh, when I'm truly honest, 15 years later, in my work, um, you know, I just think that we, uh, we have a long ways to go and it, it manifests in the marketing It manifests in government investments and policy It manifests in all these different areas. And, uh, you know, we've grown a lot and it's been because it's been indigenous led. And I got to tell you, we've had the flight, like fight, scratch, claw our way to the top. And much to what Martinique said, sometimes we've had to make many people very uncomfortable, but it's not, it's again, it just, it's, if it's not, a, if, if it's about us, it better not be without us. It's that simple. I love that. Right. That's an amazing saying. Thank you so much, Keith Henry. Um, investment and authenticity. Those are two things we should take from this. Um, I'm going to move to Fazal Pahardin, who is the founder and CEO of Crescent Rating and CEO of Halal Trip, um, two leading authorities on Muslim travelers. With Crescent Rating, um, it shows that Muslim travelers are a $190 billion market and many areas like hospitality, destinations, airports, they don't actually provide equal access to service for these types of travelers, whether it's halal food or prayer rooms. So if they're such a big purchasing market, um, Fazal, what do you think, why, do you, why is there still this lack of inclusive, inclusivity of Muslim travelers? Is this unconscious? racial bias combined with Islamophobia. Um, what's kind of going on there and how do you at Crescent Rating try to help brands see this opportunity to work with these travelers, but also why it's necessary to include them? Yep, thanks. Uh, thanks, Alex. Thanks for having me today. Um, 
I'm a bit luckier. I'm on the end of the day, so I don't have to get up early as uh, as Keith has done. <laughs> Uh, the short answer is, uh, uh, you know, educating the industry, and that's what we have been basically doing for the last almost 12 years. Slightly longish answer. Uh, I think when it comes to the Muslim market, it's a, it's a complex problem that we are facing. I mean, we all have our own uh, problems, you know, when it comes to our specific markets. But when it comes to the Muslim market, you know, we have, <laughs> we all know that you have, on one side, we have I, I call them a bunch of lunatics who sort of, you know, you know, do crimes on, and put it on us, you know, on, <laughs> and base it on our faith. And, and on the other side, you have the Islamophobia industry. So what happens is that you, you have businesses now struggling to see the reality of the Muslim consumer market because they are, they are, their view is all blurred. They are looking through these lenses of the, you know, and, and you have a media narrative, which is basically negative when it comes to Muslims across the world. Um, and I think when it comes to the Muslim market, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's these factors which are probably, you know, be making it much more difficult for businesses to sort of cater to the market because they are, they are not sure, you know, should we cater, should we not cater? You know, if we cater, will there be a backlash? Because the, the narrative out there, you know, when you, when you see, I mean, you, you see that, you know, uh, even recently, I mean, in a country, we all know, uh, a minister said, why should you have a, a halal food shelf in the supermarket? I mean, uh, if that's the narrative, you know, you know, businesses, I mean, at the end of the day, businesses, you know, they, they have to make money. So, um, and that's what they exist. But at, at the same time, they also don't want to sort of get, uh, get bashed in the media. So I think that's the biggest uh, biggest issue that we are facing in the Muslim market. Having said that, having said that, it, it depends on where you are. I mean, in this part of the world, I think it's not really an issue. Uh, we have, you know, many countries who are catering to, you know, different markets and, and Muslim market is, is a huge opportunity for them. Um, and, and uh, you know, that's, that's what, you know, we, we try to do, you know, we try to sort of demystify the market. At the end of the day, these two groups who are creating this most screen, are very small minorities, but at, but they make the loud, loudest noise, you know. Um, so it, it's uh, so our effort the last almost twelve years is to sort of make it a very objective discussion, uh, and we have spent a lot of time in doing a lot of research. You know, we 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 release almost two three reports jointly with Mastercard on, on the Muslim market in terms of you know at the end of the day, business only understand one thing. You know, it's I mean. Yes, we all, you know, ethics is important, but at the end of the day, numbers are important for the businesses. So we try to tell them you know, how big is the market uh, and, you know, what you need to do this market. So I think it's education. Educating the industry is probably, at least in the Muslim market point of view, I think it's probably so true in the other markets as well. You know, educating um, the, the, the industry, the stakeholders is, is absolutely key. Thank you, Fazal. I'm so glad that y'all release those reports. It is very significant for companies and brands to consider. And I hope you go look at Crescent Ratings website to see more of those reports. Um, next up is Uwern Zhang. I'm so excited to have you here. He is the editor in chief of the luxury travel magazine, Out There Magazine, and the board director for the International LGBTQ Plus Travel Association. Uwern, your magazine focuses on the luxury travel market a market that some people might say lags behind when it comes to addressing racism. Um, they seem to do well with LGBT represent representation, which I know Out There Magazine does have a focus on. Um, but what's going on with racism? Why do you think the sector lags behind and what can they do to you know, get here, get in the conversation? Well, um, firstly, Alex, thanks for having me. Uh, you've been really an inspiration actually to me. Uh, because you keep pushing the envelope in luxury travel beyond my home ground of LGBT inclusivity to ensure that race, intersectionality and other strands of inclusion are addressed. But like Martinique, I also say it how it is. So I think that firstly, the movement for LGBT acceptance is among the most recent of the diversity strands to gain acceptance, legal protection, and for want of a better word, equality, because we are way off equality. But it has been 50 years since the start of the movement for LGBT rights. Uh, and from a social justice timeline, that's a short amount of time, straddling only really two ge generations. So unlike the early civil rights movement on race, LGBT has immediately jumped into the most upwardly mobile, digital and boundless woke generation, so to speak, because face it, 
You know, as recently as 10 years ago, when I started out there as a travel magazine to address the lack of representation in luxury travel media for the LGBT segment, there was no such thing as equal gay marriage in the UK, US, and many other countries in the world. And while I say this, I do this so while recognizing my privilege as a gay Asian person that lives and works in the UK, because I will add there are still so many countries in the world, many of which people love to travel to, that still don't afford social equality to LGBT people or worse, criminalize it. And that also goes for women, people of color for that matter. Um, but we have come on as a community leaps and bounds in life, but also in the travel industry. And I want to point out the important role that allyship has had to play in all of this. There have been many leaders in the luxury travel industry that have stood up for the LGBT market. And allyship is so important in driving any movement forward. I, for one, have seen it in action over and over again in my work for the International LGBTQ Travel Association, where many straight allies from some of the world's biggest travel brands have vocally championed our cause. And why? As Fazal said, because they see the LGBT community as one that is particularly visible, vocal and united, particularly in their high propensity to travel. And it's no secret that the industry has moved really quickly, in my opinion, um, because they don't just see supporting our segment as good for their brand, but they also see it for good as business and bottom line. And for all these reasons, I believe there's less systemic inequalities uh, against LGBT people than for people of color. And lastly, and I think most importantly, I can tell you that much of the luxury travel industry are led by LGBT people. There's a great number of us working in travel. Uh, and the bonus ball here is that for the most part, they happen to be white and male. Uh, so when you have people at the top of the travel food chain who are part of the community, but happen to check off all the other crucial boxes that, present, that prevent them from experiencing systemic prejudices that others may face, that goes such a long way to help us push forwards as a community and gain the trust of the important allies. Uh, as what I'd like to see to turn things around, well, there are so many things, uh, but you know, I am an impatient person and everyone keeps telling me about taking small steps and taking small steps, but I appreciate that baby steps can lead to giant steps, but I just need to get there quicker. We all need to get there quicker. But I think the most important next step is to ensure that representation of BAME people or people of color in the upper echelons of travel business and the industry at large. We need more of these people. We need people uh, from all diverse backgrounds to be at the top level board table of these organizations. That's crucial. And right now, it, it just, it's just not happening. We need more people up there. And I know you're gonna ask me as to why this is later. So in interest of time, I'll explain why when you do. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna open this next question up to a few of our panelists. Um, does, Fazal, Martinique, and Keith, you do a lot of work in advertising and partnerships and um, brand awareness. What are some ways in which the tourism industry can do better when it comes to an inclusive approach to marketing? Um, Martinique, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, um, I think this is a question that I've answered probably a million times a week since June. <laughs> um, you know, I always tell brands like, you don't have to be like, hey, black girl, we want you in our, our destination, you know? And I say, keep your same messaging, but change the photo. You know, it's something that simple. People fail to realize that multicultural travels are 70% more likely to do business with brands where they see themselves reflected. It's as simple as I hear about your destination. So the first thing I'm gonna do as a millennial is go look at you on Instagram. If I don't see myself reflected, you're automatically X out. I'm like, oh, they don't even think about me. They don't even think about me, but they have this many followers. They have this many posts. And not once that they say, oh, the black traveler who spends $63 billion plus comes here. Oh, you know, the Mexican American traveler who spends 70 billion. Oh, you know, the LGBTQIA plus traveler who spends 76 billion comes here. Oh, the Muslim traveler. No, they don't think about that, you know? And it's so funny that um, you asked Fazal about that because Muslim travelers spend more than anybody anybody, right? By 2026, they're projected to spend 300 million, I mean, billion, excuse me, on travel. They inject the most into the travel industry. We don't see them anywhere. If it's that easy for you to put uh, gluten-free and vegetarian on your menus, why can't you put halal? It makes no sense to me. You know what I mean? Anytime you see Keith, when have you guys ever seen Keith represented like this? You don't. You only see anybody from Keith's nationality dancing and, and, and drumming. Why? Is that all Keith knows how to do? Absolutely not. So it's like, come on, like think about how to represent people outside of your social stereotypes that you've placed upon people. And especially with your marketing. I tell people all the time, we want heartfelt, purpose-driven marketing, right? If, if there's a negative connotation out there about black people knowing how to swim, show me swimming. 
they make, right? <laughs> they make, they make um, burkinis for Muslim women. That means Muslim women swim. Why don't we ever see Muslim women diving or swimming in your hotel, anything, right? It doesn't make any sense to me. You know, why don't we see plus size travelers surfing or at a surf school? Well, you know why? Because you don't even think to have a 3X wetsuit in your establishment where you're teaching people how to serve. So it's really just being mindful. And I tell people all the time, numbers don't lie. That's why we have research. So if we're telling you this is how much people spend and you're still choosing to ignore it, then you don't want new customers anyways. And I always ask brands, are you trying to appeal to people who already spend money with you? Are you trying to now connect with new customers? You have to understand how to connect with inclusive communities, not only online, but through your traditional media as well. So know that you're gonna spend some money to show somebody with my pretty face on your website, on your social media, you know, in your traditional media. Let, let them know you're gonna see somebody like Keith who is in a travel professional position. You see what I'm saying? It's like, just be mindful of the message that you're putting out there. Does it smash negative stereotypes? Does it show all types of people doing all types of things? Are you mindful? Did you think about it before you actually put it out? You know, even, even to, to travel conferences, if somebody right now wanted to see this and they were deaf, how would they be able to see this? Would it be accessible to them? Unfortunately not. You know why? Because nobody thought about them. But they spend also in the travel industry. They want to understand also how to do things, how to connect with people. So it's really just being more mindful. It really is. It's really looking not with who, who you are and who the top five people in your company are around you, but looking outside of that and saying, who is really spending money and how can we appeal to them? Phenomenal answer. Fazal, do you want to go next? Yeah, no, I think I think I, I definitely agree with Martinique. You know, I mean, all what you said, and she seems to know the Muslim market as well, the numbers as well. <laughs> um, I think the, 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 the feedback we get, and I, I'm not sure why some people say that, it's probably an excuse, mm -hmm. is that, you know, uh, this whole thing about, you know, if, if, we if we start marketing to this segment, will I have a negative impact on, I mean, you get this from the hoteliers, you know, okay, if I have more Muslims coming into my hotel, will I suddenly lose my other customers, you know? I mean, I, it's strange to me. I mean, hotel, I mean, the travel industry has been catering to multiple groups of people for probably thousands of years, thousands of years, you know, hospitality didn't start yesterday, uh, you know, so, uh, so it, I think it's 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 the as you say the biases which are creating those kind of uh, you know mentality you know we I mean for instance Singapore uh, you know we have twenty percent of our visitors to Singapore are Muslims and we are still growing everybody comes everybody enjoys Muslims enjoy what they you know what they came for they don't have issues with with having food they don't have a problem with that so I mean it's always possible to cater to multiple groups you know I mean it's 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 just that. You no, know, you have to, and I, I agree with you. I mean, one of the things also Muslims, uh, they keep telling us, you know, we don't want you to, you to treat us very special. You know, we're not really special. We are like anybody else. Just make us inclusive in your, in your, in your marketing, in your, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your communication. We don't want to be specially, specially targeted as somebody very different with four legs and three hands or something. You know, you know we, we have the normal, you know, we, we don't, Muslims don't go to a, uh, London, for instance, to start reading their Quran in the hotel. You know, we don't go there for that. You know, we don't go there for, you know, sitting, you know, go to the beach and pray. You, know, you go, you, you go there for doing exactly what others do. You know, it's just that there are certain requirements that you want to, want them to be, you know, not worried about and, you know, cater to that. And that mes message has to come through your marketing, you know. Uh, I mean, I, mean, I you know, it's, sometimes it's misused, but, you know, uh, ha, ha, you know, when you promote, have a, have a, you know, that's the easiest way. I mean, it's stereotyping a little bit, but the easiest way, have a female with, you know, with a headscarf. It shows that you, okay, you understand something, you know. Uh, it's not the ideal, uh, you know, as I say, it's sometimes misused, but, you know, those are ways of, you know, sort of giving the message, you know, all types of people are welcome in the destination. Great answer. Keith, would you like to go? Yeah, I'll just, uh, I, I totally agree with my colleagues. I, I think the, I'd like to flip it one other way. Why do we always have to join their campaigns? Why don't, why don't major brands and, and marketing partners invest in our campaigns? Like it, it is a really, when I was talking about my initial commentary, that was certainly some, one of the points I'm, I was hoping to have the opportunity to raise. 
you know, we're, you know, in Canada, whether it's one of our provincial or territorial destination marketing organizations or destination Canada, there's always this perception of we're going to have to buy into their campaigns because they know the market better and they understand the market better and they're going to reach the customers. The fact is we are reaching new customers and what Canada is learning slowly but surely is that indigenous tourism is one of the strongest motivators for both domestic and international markets. Yet, you know, we were like prior to COVID, we were the fastest growing set of metrics there was. We were outpacing mainstream tourism by significantly. Our growth was 20% plus year over year versus much less in the rest of the tourism sector. And it's not that the Canada was expanding with a bunch of new visitors. The fact was visitors were looking for different things. And we have 1,700 businesses across the country that are Indigenous owned and operated. They were looking for different packaging experiences. So my point is a lot of our industry never took the time to listen to that. They didn't understand that. They didn't understand how to reach those consumers. Well, we as Indigenous people with our Indigenous organization said, look, we're going to show a better pathway to sales here. Because it is the bottom line that drives it. It is the feasibility and it is the in the market share, if you want to call it that. So I think um, that's where that unconscious bias is so challenging in our sector. Everyone wants us to give them content. Let's just create content for you. And, and, but they don't want to pay for it. They don't want to help pro cross promote. They don't want to do other packaging promotions. We've created all of those tools and people look at us and it's, you know, I, I know some of these people are, you know, I, I have respect for them at a certain professional level, but I sit in many rooms uh, where I say to myself, when are they going to realize their bias? When are they going to actually, and you just want to scream, but you can't because you, you're carrying the voice in my position of 1700 businesses and it's not, doesn't do anybody any good. So you're constantly fighting that, 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 that bias, you know, they don't see indigenous marketing professionals as real. They don't see our businesses as truly market and export ready. There's always these barriers I hear about that are, that are there. So the point is, why don't they invest with like, we created, for example, Destin, our, in the ITAC, we created a campaign called escape from home in this sense of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, what's happening in, in Canada with COVID and we can only travel within Canada. So we created this, this whole seven week platform and, you know, uh, we had one partner come along and invest with us, but other than that, that was it. And it was, I found it really interesting at a time of crisis and a time when we really need partnerships. I see the people defining partnership as a one way street that we're just there to provide content and we don't just drum and sing. We're contemporary. We're all these other things. Uh, what was traditional a hundred years ago or hundred today uh, from a hundred years ago was that that hundred years ago was contemporary culture evolves, things evolve. We're not stuck in the past, but people want to believe that. And that's the images they want to use. So I think there's a lot to unpack there, but I just want to say, I find it continually disappointing that whether it's the private sector businesses within tourism or government marketing organizations or municipal, that they don't realize that it's not just about them. If they truly want to reach consumer markets, if they're honest about the research and honest about what visitors want, they need to mutually invest in things together. And um, that's why I keep saying it's not about us without us. And those are the reasons why we say those things very, um, uh, conti we will continue to say them for years to come, I'm sure. Investment. I'm so glad that you brought the viewpoint of this marketing and partnerships to a whole nother level. Um, phenomenal answers, all three of you, thank you. Um, let's talk to Uwern and Jock Ray about representation. Um, what do travel brands and companies need to do to diversify intersectionally, hopefully, um, in management levels, in um, even in you know face-to-face -face, um, aspects of of tourism and travel, whether that's like from the ground up, from up down? What what are kind of your views on why we need representation at different levels and why this is important? We need to be top down. Listen, I, I say this from personal experience. I am one of the only editors of color in the Western world travel media. And I think back to a time when actually you and I, Alex, worked together on one about this live webinars on racism earlier this year. Uh, it was virtually impossible to find any board level leaders of color in the European travel landscape. And of the ones that we did find, many declined to speak because they feared repercussions. And two are actively gagged, if you remember, from speaking on the subject by their companies, one just 24 hours before we went live. Diversity has definitely not reached the top. 
And those on top clearly see it as a very difficult and challenging topic. And that shocks me. If you have senior people of color leaders, for leaders of color, for heaven's sake, champion them. Like with what I said on the LGBT segment, there needs to be strong leaders in the industry so that they can influence change operationally and systemically and be role models and enablers for others to rise within the industry. And that's so important. You have to realize, and many people don't, so I'm going to say it really bluntly. There are significant barriers for people of color to rise in the travel industry. It's true, it's real, it exists. People of color struggle to rise in the travel industry, fact. And it's ridiculous as much as it sounds in 2020. And for there to be a wholesale change, we need to level the playing field, or at least get to a point where it actually proportionally represents the real world. We are also more intersectional than ever before. And while we tend to put ourselves in community pigeonholes, no one is, one person is ever just LGBT, for example. No one person is ever just black. Today, more than ever, we are the sum of many verticals like me. I'm gay and Asian. And to drill down further, Asian's even a problem in itself because I'm Southeast Asian, Malaysian, in fact. And while I celebrate my double dip diversity, there are others that don't or won't. I know a black lesbian leader in tourism who will not come out at work. Why? Because she's concerned about the double, actually triple glass ceiling that she has above her. She feels that as her career progression is hampered because she's a woman of color. And if she comes out as an LGBT woman of color, she won't ever get anywhere. Yes, she seriously needs to address her concerns as an individual, but we also have to ask the tourism industry why. That one, one is rooted, at, the tourism industry is rooted in being worldly and welcoming. That's the very essence of what we do. Why is there someone who is part of it, who is a leader in it, feel this way? Why do they feel that they can't come out and they can't be themselves? So how do we do it? Well, we need to recruit and we need to involve. We need to listen and learn. And most importantly, we need to take action. So many times have I heard the notion of workplace diversity being thrown up in the air. Hopefully someone will come and catch it. Um, but no one's ever really that committed to doing anything about it. There are people of color who are more than capable out, out there. Yeah, we can be editors, GMs and CEO. I'm a case in point. Build a proactive commitment to racial diversity, to inclusion of all types within your business, proactively. And that's the key word here. It's like the difference between non-racist and anti-racist. You want to be anti-racist, so you need to be proactive. And it's all our responsibilities, not just that of HR. Be an ally. I can't give you more poignant advice than that. Everyone needs to be an ally, even if, like me, you are from a different diversity strand yourself. I have made a decision to be a proactive champion on race, gender, or actually the removal of all notions of gender, age, ability, and understand that others may not walk the same path as you and give them the leg up whenever you can. And through those people of color who are leaders in the industry, please help others. Don't prescribe to the systemic privilege notions when you get to that senior position in that world. We may live in an age where equality is stronger than ever, but equality does not mean diversity and diversity does not mean inclusion. We all have to work hard to ensure that we have all three in the travel industry at any one time. Beautifully said, allyship, help each other out. We need to see it from the top down. Jock Ray, you work as a, you work as a flight attendant for Southwest Airlines, and so you mm -hmm. get to um, kind of see representation from a different perspective. And mm -hmm. how would you like to see more representation in the aviation industry or in travel and tourism? I would like to see it again from the top down because if we don't have people in those spaces having those conversations, then we'll, it'll never change. Like from a CEO perspective, like from a, a middle management perspective, all the way down, because it is a trickle down thing. And we can't, okay, so I'm a flight attendant. So I get to work directly with people. And I have made it a point not to reward bad behavior. So when I see somebody on the plane doing something that I would consider, example, um, <laughs> This is so terrible. But um, a, a lady walks on and she sits down and then a whole family of, of Asian people, a whole family sits down and no conversation the entire flight. She gets up and she tells them to go back. And I kick her off the plane because you cannot, we can't award bad behavior. Like I don't separate them or just tell them. I, I've made it a point to be very strategic in, in how I handle people. I, I can't, I can't, you can't do it in front of me. So that's me being anti-racist because it, I don't care who it happens to. 
I, I cannot let it happen in front of me. So I, I just think that representation matters. And if we don't start having conversations with people outside of our five block radius, it'll never change. Like we have to welcome people into our house. After COVID's over, that is what I'm going to do. Start having people in my house because things don't change. Proximity changes perspective. So if we are not close to that, we will never have a different perspective about how that person or, or those people act or, or, or how they relate to one another. Thank you, yes. Be friends with people that you want to work with, that you want to represent. Connect with them on real levels. That is exactly right. Um, even so, those that you don't, I'm sorry, even though oh, yeah, yeah. you wouldn't necessarily like ch going past that, like, you know, it doesn't necessarily be like everybody has value. I don't think that we know how much value other people have because we don't, because of marketing, <laughs> like it is a marketing thing. Like if we don't know, but just challenge yourself to think outside of what you've been told because we've all been told something and we just regurgitate it based on the images that we see just pushing past what is normal in your mind sorry i just wanted to say this <laughs> no thank you i'm so glad so we're in a pandemic tourism is not doing fantastic right now travel has been beaten down um there might be some people watching that says we're in a pandemic we're trying to rebuild Economically, things aren't great. Maybe we should focus on racism later. Maybe that's something we shouldn't focus on now because I'm trying to build up my business or whatever it may be. What would you say to this? Would any, I will open it up for anyone to begin. Yeah. I can, I, can I jump in? Sorry, I'll just say yeah. that there has to be a part, diversity and inclusion has to be a part of your every day. It's not a campaign, it's not, it's not a one-off thing. And that's the problem. When you do it, it appears tokenistic. If you do it in that way, it's tokenistic. And tokenism is, is a terrible, terrible thing. It has to be part of your everyday and you need to build that in. If you haven't got it, you're not woke and you need to be woke. Today's traveler is woke. And particularly with everything that's happened through COVID, we're seeing it through the research at our magazine. People are looking for brands that actively take a part in caretaking for the world. And caretaking is not sustainability. For a long time, we've been talking about sustainability in the environmental sense. Caretaking also involves sustainability in the social sense. And people are looking for that now. And the brand that will do best coming out of COVID will be the brand that have really, really looked into this. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think if it's, it's the reverse. I think it's, it's probably, it's, it becomes more important within the COVID context because we are all searching for every dollar out there. The tourism industry is looking for every dollar out there. So if I was, you know, I was running a destination, I would try to find all the niche markets that I could get at, you know. Uh, so I, I think it's, it becomes much more important. I mean, it's, I mean, it's all, it has been always important, but now I don't think you can say, you know, let's worry about something, you know, uh, the, the mass market anyway the mass market tourism is going to disappear as as we all you know talk about it and and you know recently i was talking to a, a tourism guys and they say look you know this group tours are going to disappear so you're, you're talking really about really about finding you know those niche markets you know those walk uh, travelers you know uh, so i think it, it becomes more important uh, that we focus on those markets now and especially at least from you know I have data on Muslim markets and and at least in this part of the world Muslim markets becoming a lot more important post COVID than it used to be actually. I, yeah, I'd like to add to that too. I mean, I think um, the crisis defines our values, and I, I, I really believe that it's really good or bad. It's it's showing you know we're quickly running to save parts of the tourism sector here in this country. Uh, we're all, we've also done some work to stabilize Indigenous tourism. I mean, um, you know, prior to COVID, we had 1,700 robust businesses becoming very profitable and creating jobs for their local community and, and really, you know, making a difference, uh, which is what our reason for being is at ITAC. You know, we created the brand Destination Indigenous. We've done all this work for years to build these kind of things to make it simpler. Uh, but the fact is, and even in our country, as, as more, I think, uh, uh, culturally aware as Canada likes to position itself, 
we're really seeing some gaps now. You know, are we going to stabilize our sector? I look at the the, the WTM, you know, tagline. It's you know, uh, uh, recover, rebuild, stabilize, or, or innovate. Pardon me. And and I say to myself, well, what's innovative if we're not doing new things? You know, what what is different? Are we just going to get in front of these trade shows? Like I've been to this, the, the circuit of trade shows around the world. I see the same major brands, the same players in many cases, pitching the same ideas. So what are we going to do different? Let's challenge how we can really think about different. Much to what um, uh, Frazzle said, I mean, it isn't going to be big group tours. We think that Indigenous tourism in our country provides exactly what the future is going to look like. Small groups, outdoor adventure, uh, learning, bringing back the cultural values of what Indigenous people live by. I think we think that's going to drive tourism in a whole new direction. And we think what could come out of this is going to be important, but we have to stabilize our sector. So what are we doing to, you know, uh, incubate, protect, make sure that we can rebuild post COVID. I mean, COVID's here in front of us in Canada, where he's seeing a second wave. And are we going to, because right now I can say of 1700 businesses, we've lost at least 700 already to the COVID. Uh, uh, the impacts of loss of economy. I mean, our, our businesses, uh, you know, there's this misconception in Canada, that somehow indigenous communities just get all this money from government. And we just, these are businesses, they have to be feasible, we have to drive market interest, we have to, I mean, th there's no different than any other business out there. And that's one of the systemic issues we face that, oh, well, it doesn't really matter, we don't have to rush because, you know, the government is going to pour money into the community. That's not, it's absolutely not true. So I mean, the fact is, how are we going to re help stabilize the sector for all of, for, uh, for us in Canada, for Indigenous tourism, and how are we going to allow rebuilding to happen? You can't rebuild if 75% if of your businesses disappear because they've gone bankrupt and solvent, or the sentiment is communities have lost hope that tourism will ever be a way forward. And for us, that's a really critical issue in Canada. Many of our communities have shifted their economic development from what was oil and gas or other uh, forestry, fisheries, all the other sectors. They still do some of that. But tourism was becoming a really big driver for economics, for our community, cultural preservation, creating local jobs. And, uh, you know, so are we stabilizing it? And in Canada, we, we've got a long ways to go. So we've done some good stuff. But uh, nowhere near what we have to do right now. And, and I would say to anyone listening to the travel industry, what are you doing to help stabilize? I mean, you you do need to think about the market differently. And I think some of our product and experiences is going to be exactly the future of tourism. And uh, it's time to shift now. Fantastic. I'm so glad we, we got to that question. I was really intent that we got there. Um, so we have good time. I'm gonna start looking at questions that we got from the audience today. Um, just a little note to the uh, panelists. Somebody did write in and say, this is the best panel that they've seen at WTM so far. So people are really excited and really loving your conversation. Um, I got a question here and I know what I would say to this, but I'm gonna kind of um, change the way it was asked. Um, I think there's a concern if a company does a specialized extreme nicheified campaign toward one market that it can become discriminatory. Is this the case? Um, can, would somebody like to speak to this? <laughs> Absolutely. First of all, if you wrote that, that question, then you have to understand that you have a problem. You have a problem with looking at what the industry has seen. You're asking about if a campaign was directed towards a group of people when all of the things we've ever seen has been only white people in campaigns. And I'm sorry, show me something that has not been like that. I'm telling you right now, less than 2% probably has anybody who looks something different than other people than white. So take a step into my shoes, somebody who's never seen themselves reflected in most of these travel ads or promotions, and now answer your own question. When, when people say stuff like that, it just really, it's a trigger for me um, because they're like, oh, positive discrimination. You can't have positive discrimination. Discrimination is not a positive thing, okay? So maybe this is something 
um, let's say this, all right, I, I just created a book that tells you all about black communities and black owned businesses in six out of seven continents, right? There's an Afro Yemen community that is indigenous to Yemen. Yes, black people in Yemen. So if you decided every October to run some type of specific campaign to not only black people in the US, but black people in the UK who can travel to Yemen, that would be appropriate because that's when they celebrate their African heritage in October. So is that positive discrimination or does that make sense because you made the connection? So questions like that, I'm sorry. I'm just like, no, no, please don't ask questions like that because no, it's not a problem because you've never done it before. You've never reached out to that community before, but who you have shown all the time is able-bodied, thin, blonde haired white people. And I'm not saying that those are problem travelers. They're not, but those are the only people that we've ever seen. I've never seen a full black family in anything other than Tempe, Arizona. And then not only did they have a full black family, they showed them swimming. And I'm like, yay, smashing this negative stereotype. When have you ever seen a full Muslim family in any of your travel ads or promotions? Does that mean that you're discriminating against everybody else? No, that means you understand that they'll be spending 300 million by 2026 and you want a piece of that pie. So discrimination and positive, or, or you can't use that in the same sentence. Just go ahead and erase that out of your mind because it doesn't even exist. It does not exist based off of what we've seen for the past <laughs> since 20 to, since the beginning of travel advertisements and promotions. So please don't ever ask that question again. Just take it out and, of your head right now. There's no such thing as positive discrimination. And, and Alex, and um, you know, uh, we we do work with a lot of tourism boards in this part of the world, as, at least. <laughs> There's a lot of work done like that, actually. You know. Uh, there are Muslim visitor guides uh, released by many tourism boards in this part of the world. Visitor guide for Muslims. This is, you know, this is mm -hmm. what you can do when you come to our country. Uh, there are campaigns which are targeted at the Muslims. So I, I think, I mean, industry has been, uh, you know, uh, it's just that as, as Mart I think Martinique uh, explained enough of that, you know. Um, yeah, I think it's being done by countries and we, we actually work with a number of them to, to specifically target the Muslim market and they're doing for other markets as well, you know, but you know, it's, it's that's life. I just say, just like to, to my point earlier, equality does not mean diversity because you're giving everybody the same. It doesn't mean that someone is feeling special. Our job in hospitality is to create memories, to create good times, right? So if you're treating everyone the same, I have this analogy where everyone's looking over the fence at a, a match, Alex has heard it, you know, there's a tall white person, there's someone that's short like me, an Asian person, there's someone in a wheelchair. Equality is giving everyone the same size box. Therefore, the tall person gets to see way over the fence. I'm jumping over the fence, look after. And, and the person in a wheelchair can't even see over the fence. It does not create a great experience if you treat everyone equal. So you need to go out of your way to find ways to reach certain demographics, to make sure they're amplified in your marketing and also in your workforce. Can I just add one thing or another piece of this? I, I, you know, I've heard that same line of questioning for 15 years in this industry in Canada for indigenous experience, our tourism businesses. And, you know, it is, it's a bias. That in itself, that question reflects a serious bias that while we can't treat you special, well, if you actually care about consumers, you should care because, uh, we, we, you know, I have to speak a certain way with our Indigenous communities about why tourism is important. Uh, it's about more of a social cultural value and the, uh, it's not about the economics. But as soon as I get into the tourism industry, it's always about the economics. But in both, the, 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 the test passes because consumers want Indigenous experiences. And the problem we've got is we've got an industry that thinks they're going to define what that experience is. And that has always been our big issue. It's getting better, but we've got so much further to go. One tangible example, you know, whether it's this WTM or what we host in Canada, Rendezvous Canada, our largest trade show. I remember being there a number of years ago when I looked around and there's, you know, roughly 900 sellers from Canada, from all the provinces and territories. We had four Indigenous businesses in the entire show. Four. So part of our thinking was we need to create an Indigenous showcase. We want to make Canada as one of the premier destinations for Indigenous experiences. We knew we had hundreds of, at that time, hundreds of businesses. Why are we not engaged in one of the most important sales channels that there is in the tourism space? Well, you know what, we've done that. And the, the, over the last number of years, we've gone from having four to about, you know, anywhere from 100 to two, 200 businesses represented in what we call the National Indigenous Showcase at the centerpiece of that show. 
But you know who the biggest critics were? Was the industry itself. The industry saying, oh, you're, you're giving our indigenous experience a special treatment. What, what's going, well, no, no, no. You guys had many years, that show has been around for a number of decades. You had a number of years to take our businesses and feature them and you did nothing. So we're gonna show you how it gets done. And that's the stuff where I say that bias, you hear it in me, it's a trigger with me as well. It's like, listen, if you're not going to help us get out of the way and let and give us the platform, we'll figure it out. You know, you don't need to patronize us. We're not, you know, dumb little indigenous people. We know, we get it. We, we, we can speak your language. It's not the language we like, but we'll speak the economics if you need us to, to prove it. So um, feel very, that it's a really big issue for us and we've made it better, but I got to tell you, the biggest obstacles we've had is, key industry people, key marketing people, key government people. It's, it's, we've had to convince people one by one by one, and it's been very painful for us, but we're there a lot better today, but still a long ways to go. I would like to say that um, that question points to a bigger problem. We have to realize where these questions come from, and they always come from a place of bias, and it's a part of the system. So that, like when people say, there is no systematic racism. That question points directly to it. It, it just goes straight to it. Yes. Um, okay, so last question. We only have maybe four minutes left. Short term, long term, what would you suggest that tourist leaders do, uh, destinations do, aviation industry, hotels, whatever it may be, what are your short-term, long-term suggestions of actionable things they can do to fight racism in tourism? Well, I think from, from, a, from a specifically Muslim market point of view, it's, it's to educate the industry. I mean, I think it is so important to educate the demystify. I mean, especially when it comes to the Muslim market, there's so much of negative narrative going on there, I think, which is absolutely not, not true. Uh, so I think education, short term, medium and long term, it's, it's education. Once you understand the reality, once you take away all these, all these things that you hear, I think you will understand that it's a huge market. I think the second thing, I think as, as we are discussing, as as we are trying to push this, um, these things to the market, I think we, I mean, that's what I found out, you know, when I started 12 years ago, I needed numbers. Uh, that's the language that uh, the business understands. Uh, and that's why we got into the, I mean, that's not our main thing, you know, re doing research and putting out numbers, but that's a, re a reality when you're dealing with businesses. So I think we need to keep showing them the numbers um, and say, look, you cannot afford to miss a, Forget about the 300 billion market. You can't afford to even miss a hundred million dollar market, you know. And we need, you know, travel industry need all the dollars that it, it can get. I would just say, sorry, um, I was just going to quickly say, do you have a strategy? I mean, what it's like for us in Canada, like we we, we say to our our uh, what are called tourism boards for some of you or our destination marketing organizations, what is your what is your indigenous strategy? Do you have one? Like, I mean, let's just start with that question. And then sadly, most of our partners don't, and they don't have a, so my, my point is we, we, we create strategy. We say, well, why don't you look at ours, use ours as let, let's pick and choose the things that we have. We've created a national strategy to do these very things. So we try and really lead by example. Like we don't want them to feel like they're on their own. We don't want them to feel threatened at the same time. So it's always, a, it's a really, it's a, it's a careful balance, but you know, just uh, help them design a simple strategy. Don't make it too cumbersome and uh, really, like, you know, and find out what's the equal value proposition, right? I mean, it's basic negotiation, but I really just start with it. Do you have a strategy? Uh, I would say in in upper management, just diversity. And then when you are diverse, making sure that, that those people have a safe space where they can say what they need to say. Because if you're not, if you just allow people to come and be a part of upper management and don't allow them to freely speak, it it, uh, it doesn't do it any 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 good. So just diversity and a safe space to further uh, uh, an agenda for everyone. I'll say first, understand there's a problem. And thank you for everyone for coming here today because you're, you're taking a proactive steps to understand that there's a problem. Because I still find that in 2020, people don't see the problem. 
you know, the number of times I've been told, oh, do people still get asked whether they want two beds if, you know, if you're a gay couple checking in or when I, is it offensive to you that someone says konnichiwa when you walk through the door of a hotel? You know, there is a problem. Recognize there's a problem. Then secondly, take action. That's the most important thing. Recognize your privilege and then take action because you really, and, and then be an ally. Short term, medium term, long term. Be an ally, always be an ally. Allyship, we can't do this without allies. I've learned that in the LGBT market and the LGBT market has come on leaps and bounds because of allies. Be an ally, however you can. Thank you. Okay, so we have one minute left. I just wanna say thank you for everybody who joined this panel today. We had a really good discussion. You gave really great feedback to everybody. Everybody who was in the audience, please take this, everything that they said, Please go do more research, connect with them on LinkedIn, look at their articles that they've written, look at the books and the videos that they put out. Um, do a virtual coffee date to discuss with their, create partnerships with many of these people on this panel today, please. Um, if you have time, go look at the Responsible Partnership, uh, Responsible Tourism Partnership on YouTube, watch the series. You will hear a bunch of other people discuss racism and tourism. And thank you for WTM for letting us have this conversation today. I hope to see it next year. I hope to see it every year from now here on out because this is important. It doesn't just start today. It doesn't end this year. We're gonna see this and we're gonna continue to fight for racism and tourism to be over in travel. Thank you so much. Um, and I hope you have a great day.